This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the perfect place to create a professional website for creators constantly on the go. James Cameron is a titan in the filmmaking world, having directed many legendary films, ranging from the classics like Aliens or Titanic, all the way up to modern technical marvels in cinema like Avatar, which is a movie that revolutionized VFX work and became the highest grossing movie in the world couple of times. To many people's surprise, Avatar The Way of the Water was announced in May of 2022, and the movie is set to release at the end of the year, 13 years after the first movie was shown in theaters. The trailer managed to wow with advanced CGI, water simulations, and character animation work, and the fusion of computer-generated characters interacting with live-action performances. With many problem areas ahead, like underwater motion capture, spending an unimaginable amount of money throughout the production of the movie series, and putting up with skeptics who cannot believe that a sequel to Avatar is actually happening, Lightstorm Entertainment had to develop several unusual camera systems, some of which even had to be able to work underwater. So let us dive deep and find out more about this unusual 3D cinema camera, how it works, and at the end of this video we will also talk about why wearing 3D glasses for movies may be a thing of the past. So stick around. Before we begin, I want to talk about the actual world of Avatar itself. It's absolutely breathtaking to behold, and an incredible 3D landscape still hold up excellently to today's standards. But what was so sad was that no one had a place to show off any of the beauty in the network that connected the entire planet together. You need a pretty special place to display all that, right? That's why Squarespace will be the perfect site for them to post and sell all of their weekly photos. With easy to design templates that are customizable to your specific needs, Squarespace is a great option for those needing a professional site to attract clients on an alien planet. Not only can you attract otherworldly clients, but Squarespace also allows them to quickly book you with their incredibly convenient scheduling system. If you're seriously considering building a website but have held back because the costs and the time-consuming nature of building a website, test out Squarespace today. In the time it takes you to find an oxygen mask to go walk out and take photos of this alien planet, you could have already built a website. It's how easy it is. So head right now to squarespace.com slash framevoyager with the link below in the description to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code FRAMEVOYAGER. Now back to some cameras in the movies. In some pictures in which we can see a glimpse of the camera system Lightstorm Entertainment used for Avatar 2, we can immediately see that something seems a bit off. Looking at the entire rig from a distance, we can make out that the camera James Cameron is holding is tethered to an assistance backpack, which holds two bulky boxes. Looking at the camera head on, we can see a strange lens configuration. One lens is looking straight ahead, but another lens is poking out of the bottom of the matte box. High-end camera rigs can become rather complex, but a rig like this is especially mystifying. What we are looking at is a 3D camera, which actually is composed of two Sony Venice cameras, which naturally record two separate images. The Venice camera delivers the most astonishing image I've ever seen. You get incredible dynamic range, you get perfect color. I mean, this is a stunning, crystalline, clear image. James Cameron is and always has been a believer in 3D movie making technology, having invested over a dozen years researching and experimenting with technology and filming methods that ought to be used in the next chapters of the Avatar Quintology, which is 3D, which has been reportedly dead for years. So why is this supposedly dead format so important to Cameron? Count the number of eyes in my face. There's two of them, and you've got two, and, and all God's children got two, and pretty much every animal and every insect's got at least two, every fish has got two. We experience the world through a stereoscopic system, a visual system, and when you see stereo, uh, it gives you an enhanced sense. It triggers little regions in the brain that make you feel like you're really there. Well, what do we want to do with a movie like Avatar or the or the sequels? We want to take you to Pandora. We want you to live it, breathe it, um, feel that for that moment, for that period of time, those hours that you're in the dark theater, that this is a real place and you're going on a real journey. And this helps with that. Cameron has been a believer in 3D technology ever since he filmed Terminator 2 3D. This is a move. You know, these 3D cameras are huge. These are 3D 70 millimeter, two cameras mounted. They weigh tons. One is shooting down into a beam splitter and the other one is shooting through it in order to get the two images uh, aligned. So new equipment had to be developed uh, to allow 
Jim to get the kind of shots that, that, that he wants to get. We probably had every crane ever built uh, maneuvering a 600-pound package around, including cable cam, which can move up to 30, 40 miles an hour. We hooked our 600-pound rig to that. Since the early days of 3D, 3D cameras have always had one big, bulky, and back-breaking problem, which would be this size of the camera system. An IMAX 3D film camera is impossible to hold, let alone lift, and its sheer size makes it even more difficult to film anything. For the first Avatar movie, James Cameron and the DP Vince Pace co-developed the Fusion Camera, a 3D beam splitter camera composed of two Sony F950s. Fusion Camera was an outgrowth of all the 3D camera development that Vince Pace and I had done for several years previously. It was designed to be a state-of-the-art professional cinema camera for 3D production. It needed to be faster, more responsive, more accurate, quieter to handle some of the issues that we knew we would find in a high-budget feature. Operating two cameras at once proved to be difficult, as for instance, two zoom lenses had to work in unison. Together with focus pulling, iris controls, and the new dimension added to the lens operation being the control of convergence. But making a camera operate at a certain focal length wasn't easy. Traditionally in other 3D camera systems, the camera would be configured in a master and a slave relationship, where a camera two follows each command assigned to the camera one blindly. But because this automated system led to small inconsistencies, things like setting the focal length still had to be adjusted manually. A good simulation of how 3D camera configurations function would be holding your finger up in front of your face and moving the finger away and close to your face. In order to keep focus on the finger and have better depth perception, you have to keep both of your eyes open and you need to go more and more cross-eyed the closer the finger comes to your face. The views of I1 and I2 converge. Additionally, just like what happens for a 3D movie, both images get stitched together into one 3D view and post. And there you have it, you've achieved depth perception. But why wasn't the Fusion camera or the 3D camera for Avatar 2 built in a way to position the cameras next to each other. The main problem with that configuration is that it limits just how much you can control stereoscopy. Additionally, if the cameras are too far apart from each other, subjects in the film could appear as miniatures. Or if the distance between the two cameras is too close to a subject, it may appear gigantic. Both Sony F950 cameras were about four inches wide, while the distance between our eyes averages at about 2.5 inches. In order for the distance between the recording cameras to be minimized, instead of thinking up some new complicated chassis for a novel camera system, James Cameron and Vince Pace decided to opt for a beam splitter rig, which surprisingly works exactly like a teleprompter. The design of the camera has been researched for a long period of time. What they've done is essentially assembled two cameras with a beam splitter that are able to simultaneously photograph two images at the same time. And you have a series of servos that basically you can align the two images or this line them according to how much 3D you're looking for in a shot. Using this technique, the two camera recordings can appear to be much closer together or even completely overlap each other. Avatar's Fusion Camera is a massive upgrade from the impossible to lift IMAX 3D cameras, as now the two F950s could be easily used handheld. It's a nine axis motion control system, silent, fast, and it weighs 28 pounds. I held this thing for five seconds uh, to do the, to take the intro before the show. Try shooting a movie and, with it. I mean, yeah. I, how, did your camera guys just hate you by the end of this project? I was the camera guy. I did you? There. You really handled oh, yeah, this thing? Oh yeah, yeah. I operated. I operated all the handheld shots. Yet the newer camera, Lightstorm Entertainment developed for Avatar 2, brought another upgrade with it, which brings us back to this strange picture. Instead of metaphorically duct taping two gigantic camera bodies together, Lightstorm decided to separate the image sensors from the two Sony Venice cameras and rig them in a shoulder mount configuration together with the obligatory servers in order to control the camera if a handheld shot is desired. The backpack we showcased here is holding the two Venice camera bodies. Of course, the beam splitter in its entirety was also mounted on cranes for certain shots too. Conveniently, detaching the image sensor from the camera body is a native feature that Sony offers through cable extensions that could be up to 12 meters long. And then here we are with a, a brand new uh, camera system that uh, Sony has created for us in adapting their incredible uh, Venice camera, Cine Alta camera, into one with a separate optical block. And, and this is what enables us to actually do the 3D filming with the same flexibility and, and uh, ergonomics that we could do a 2D movie years ago. Considering that Avatar 2 will be at least just as multimedial as its predecessor, it also helps that the Venice camera is a great choice for recording virtual scenes on displays, which Lightstorm seems to also have utilized during shoots judging by this photo. The Venice camera was not randomly picked out of the hat to be used for Avatar 2, judging by this promotional video from Sony. They listen to the filmmaker in terms of what features a filmmaker might want in the camera, and they'll go way out on a limb. I know that they're going to deliver the engineering. If they say they can do it, they will do it. 
Speaking of mocap, you may wonder what happens when one of the many motion capture scenes are recorded. Does Lightstorm record their actors in motion capture suits with this bulky 3D rig? Judging by the behind the scenes material from the first movie, and also considering that Avatar 2 made heavy use of image-based face motion capture again, Lightstorm could not really use their 3D cameras as a jack of all trades. For capturing movement of the face for CGI characters, small cameras are positioned under the actor's head, recording the actor's face. But motion capture data is not recorded with conventional cinema cameras, and the performance of each actor can only be previewed by using a software solution. This is where the virtual camera comes in. The virtual camera emulates a physical camera and can be operated similarly as one. Every completely CGI shot in the movie was filmed by filming the scene with virtual cameras through holding it or even potentially mounting it onto several devices to make the shot feel more natural when compared to regular keyframed camera movements. The 3D assets of the movie can then be toyed around with, replaced, and reorganized during the shoot in something that resembles a glorified game engine. This enables the camera operator to frame their shots and experiment with assets in the scene composition before an animator or a 3D environment artist touches up the scene and can even do so long after the actor's job is done. Lastly, the simulcam was used to combine motion captured animations with live action recordings as they were happening, allowing the camera operator to film a scene with CGI characters and backgrounds composited into the preview window. So much green around that you can lose sight of what we're doing. You forget that you're actually making a movie where there's bigger than life amp suits and space shuttles and to actually see that back on a monitor just gives me a little taste of what's around so you're not just playing to green it just feeds your imagination more it allows you to live in the world not just always up here. That is possible by attaching motion sensors to the beam splitter camera so the camera can be tracked in 3D space and virtual assets can then be composited into the preview on the fly. The interesting thing about Simulcam is that it integrated our fusion camera system, which was for shooting 3D, with our virtual camera system. What Simulcam did was it put the two together. It overlaid a virtual capture environment on a live action set. It allows us to treat that fusion 3D camera as if it's a virtual camera. We would actually track these 3D cameras in space. And we can feed into it the images of computer generated environments and computer generated characters at the same time. The only really big mystery revolving around the production of Avatar 2 is how underwater motion capture and live action scenes were filmed. While it's not known exactly what a beam splitter underwater rig looks like, what has to be kept in mind is that those detached sensor blocks would actually make it easier to mount the sensors in a more compact or specialized contraptions. The only big limitation being that the longest cable available for the detached sensor block solution is just about 20 feet long. A limiting length, but one that would make underwater shots or limited height drone footage potentially possible. It's also safe to assume that a large portion of the underwater scenes will be entirely motion captured, for which another great example for the convenience of virtual cameras comes to light. Instead of the virtual camera operator having to squeeze into a wetsuit and jump into the pool with a waterproof virtual camera rig, they could just stand beside the pool and position the virtual camera accordingly to preview the scene. So while potential underwater 3D scenes or 2D reference footage might be a pain to record, at the very least previewing the scene from the virtual camera remains super easy to do. The last question many would ask themselves is if 3D really is worth it for Avatar 2. Current methods of viewing 3D content all come with their ups and downs. The most prominent method of viewing 3D content would be using the passive 3D goggles which redirect the light in order for the viewer to receive the correct images into the appropriate eyes. But this passive 3D technology severely affects color vibrancy, giving 3D this typical grayed out look. An alternative to passive 3D would be the superior active 3D method which also requires a higher refresh rate video screen altogether with powered 3D goggles which quickly obscure the glasses in an alternating pattern to deliver the correct images to your eyes. Yet most people do not possess 3D capable displays at home, and even less at this point would ever invest much money in that technology as we've seen in the past. One of the more viable options for viewing 3D films at home has become the virtual reality headset. But the simple fact of the matter is that most viewers of Avatar 2 will not experience the movie in 3D, either because they generally dislike 3D movies thanks to the many previous bad productions that sadly establish 3D as a gimmick, or because they, or or the local cinemas do not have the devices to showcase the movies in three dimensions. Interestingly enough though, Lightstorm Entertainment teamed up with Christy Digital, a laser projector company, in order to develop a 3D RGB laser projector technology for the screen. Although it's believed that this projector won't debut in cinemas anytime soon, the big potential for this technology is that apparently no 3D glasses would be required in order to perceive depth when viewing movies off the projector. Although how exactly that would work 
is still unclear. So if we find out, we'll definitely make that into a video at some point. While James Cameron is a devout Sony fan, you may wonder how earlier Sony cinema cameras were used by other famous directors. For instance, the abandoned Sony Cinealta camera that was used by George Lucas to shoot the Star Wars prequels. So check out this video about these abandoned cameras here if you're interested.